Gracias, gracias por la invitación. It's so nice to be here, and uh, you've all been very, very kind to us, especially traveling from far away. Um, I'm Lynn Davis. I'm the program manager for Healthy Democracy. We're an NGO based in Oregon on the west coast of the United States. And I'm going to get a little bit specific about one particular program that we run. Um, but first, I want to talk about some of the, you know, some of the reasons why we should care about this very quickly. I think we all uh, will not be surprised by any of these things. It, uh, it's kind of a fun game. Wherever you travel in the world, you can just do a Google search for faith and democracy, and you'll find a graph that sort of trends downward. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this has to be sort of a great motivation for us right now. That's sort of a, a, a uh, you know, a dark game to play, but I think it, it should also motivate us toward, toward innovation, toward new solutions, as, uh, as you both said. And one reason why I think we are seeing this across the world right now is that we don't see ourselves in, in multiple ways in our democracies. And to be very specific about, about cities, this goes from the top right down to the bottom. And I think that we have uh, the greatest potential, however, to fix this at the local level. Because even if we feel so disenchanted with our uh, national governments, um, uh, often across the political spectrum. We still care about the street we live on and our commute to work. And that's, that's the place where we should start to, to build democracy. But let's talk about a few ways that we don't see ourselves in, in our democracies. This is a study from the United States um, showing the rates of participation in local civic and political activities by people by income. You can see there's a, a vast disparity. If you're wealthier, you participate a lot more. Likewise, in the United States, Eh? There we go. <laughs> if you're white, you participate a lot more. And why might that be? Well, there's a million reasons. But one might be very simply that we just don't ask people, uh, or we ask people at very different rates. In fact, this graph is even more of a disparity than the previous one. So it's kind of a miracle that the previous one isn't worse. Uh, and the sort of issues with current participation at the city level, I think we probably, many of us know very well. Uh, they're often not reflective of the general public. Uh, in demographic terms, they're often the same individuals over and over again as well. And that sort of self-appointment, that volunteering uh, sort of mindset towards citizen participation, I think means that our existing bodies lack uh, legitimacy. And those bodies also are inefficient because we haven't spent time on the process, and we haven't treated it as a, uh, something we need to innovate, like we treat, say, you know, autonomous vehicles, planning for the future, or green roofs, or solar power, or anything else we spend so much time innovating on. But this one, we're still using processes from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, and they're no longer effective, or maybe they never were, uh, especially with dealing with complex and divisive issues, uh, they focus on debate rather than deliberation, and they're not based on research, generally. We can do better, and we must find a new approach to democracy. Uh, we don't have the answers. We just have one little piece of a possible puzzle, but I want to present it in a little bit of detail as, as a kind of example. Uh, we do, however, think that every example needs to have three main qualities. It needs to be representative, both on, in terms of general demographics and, and that, that everyone sees someone like them uh, in positions of power, but also that it's representative of the fact that 99% of us don't really participate in our democracies, aside from maybe voting every few years. Uh, other than that, we have a very one-directional relationship with government. It sits somewhere above us. We pay taxes. We beg for assistance when there's a natural disaster. It is not a healthy relationship. We also need to resource these innovations better. We need to, they, they need to have professional facilitation. We need to spend time on uh, that sort of technical innovation. Uh, we need to provide people with the expertise that they need, and uh, we often need to pay them. And we also need to generate a sort of genuine environment of reciprocal trust. We, in the United States, we talk all the time about trust in government, but that's completely wrong. Trust doesn't exist in one direction, as anyone in a relationship knows. It just doesn't exist. You need trust in both ways in order to have trust at all. So we need systems that help those 
in government bureaucracy, uh, find that citizens can make good decisions, and also that citizens uh, find that their decisions matter. So one idea that we have uh, spent most time on is various forms of citizen juries. Um, and they have two components. First, sortition. That's the getting people in the room. It's a random selection methodology. So hopefully we don't get the usual people. And it's also reflective of the general public, a microcosm of, of whatever jurisdiction it is in the room. Uh, citizen panelists are paid, and we think that selection process gives it some inherent legitimacy. Uh, the process itself must be really strong as well. It must be highly deliberative, uh, tightly structured, involve in-depth investigation into a particular policy topic, and uh, be product-oriented, uh, that is, have a set outcome, know where we're going, as Fernando talked about, that we, we cannot just sort of get into a room and talk anymore. We need to have a place that we're headed and decision makers that are, that are ready and, and prepared to accept these recommendations or decisions. They need to be efficient and effective, transparent and public, obviously, and uh, we think that all of that uh, helps to provide these uh, better solutions. Now, there are a lot of variations to this kind of process. Sometimes they're called citizens' juries or citizens' assemblies. Um, they, they can involve anywhere from 20 to 100 plus people. Um, they can be a single panel, which is mostly what we do. They can be multiple panels. There's a couple examples in, in Europe now of sort of a general assembly and then subcommittees that are also randomly selected. The process can be four days to permanent panels. Uh, someone yesterday talked about the panels in, um, in Toronto. Uh, that are a good example, and Madrid and uh, also uh, Eastern Belgium has, a, has now a sort of parallel regional government that is uh, randomly selected uh, and is permanent. You know, shifts over every year or so, they randomly select more folks. The result uh, can be anything from agenda setting to voter information to recommendations that actually provide some normative judgment to actual decisions. So, and they can also, you know, the ideas that come into the citizens' jury can come from elected officials, staff, citizens, and come out to any of those groups as well. So I'm going to talk about just uh, one that we're working on right now. Uh, it's in a small town in Oregon, well, mid-sized town, 20,000 people. Uh, my hometown, actually, near Portland, uh, the biggest city. And it's uh, on a question from the city council, uh, should they be paid more than they currently are? Obviously, this is a very difficult question for them to answer, so the city's goal is simply for us to help them make a very divisive and uh, politically sticky issue not so terrible for them. Uh, our goal is to design an easily replicable model um, that we can take to other cities that may have other difficult decisions and, and just sort of copy it make, it, make the design process a little bit less heavy. It, uh, the idea came from electeds, it's going back to electeds. Uh, we thought for a moment it would go straight to a referendum, but that's not the case. Uh, it, it was a randomly selected panel, uh, 5,000 letters went out to random addresses, we did a selection process in public, and then selected a panel of 20 residents age 16 and up, representative on seven different factors, um, geographic location within the city, age, race and ethnicity, gender, political party affiliation, or not registered to vote, educational attainment, and renter and homeowner status. Now these citizen juries have basically four parts of the deliberation, and, and these, are, these are common throughout them. The first part, and this the number one takes the first half of the whole process, uh, is the panelists hear evidence. They question a wide variety of experts, evaluate the facts, and ident start to identify salient information. That goes into the deliberation stage, they're dealing with this information, they're also creating criteria for making future decisions and sourcing all potential recommendations they, they can make. Then uh, they review the evidence, apply uh, the evidence to these sort of potential recommendations, and narrow down, basically. Keep narrowing until they get to one or maybe a few recommendations, and then maybe add a dissenting opinion if there's folks in the room that really disagree and can't get to agreement, and make some final edits. But these processes, like everyone's, one, are not perfect and are constantly evolving and must constantly evolve, um, like our entire democracy, and also have some common criticisms that I wanted to address really quick. So, random people aren't experts. Uh, that's number one. <laughs> um, first, random and representative groups have legitimacy. I've already talked about that. The basis of every citizen's jury, though, is evidence. 
it, it is not anti-expert in any way whatsoever. It is not sort of blindly populist. It is in fact exactly the opposite. Uh, it's providing a forum to deal deeply with evidence. However, all expertise needs interpretation in order to be used to make decisions. The question is only who does that interpretation, not whether it happens. Um, and finally, uh, these have a, a, quite a long record now uh, of uh, accuracy uh, and good quality deliberation. They've been fairly heavily studied as deliberative processes go. Also, complaints sometimes, oh, this seems time intensive and it's expensive. We think it's no more expensive than most current techniques that we use um, in cities and has a several uh, sort of extra benefits. It's a research-based process, so we think that makes the, the quality of the decisions better, potential long-term savings due to legitimacy of the process. It's also an investment in permanent civic infrastructure, both for the folks in the room, but also a broader cultural uh, culture of trust. You know, everyone of those 5,000 people who got that mailing knows something about it and, and you know, knows that they have a chance next time to uh, potentially be involved in something really important in their city government. And finally, I just wanted to um, end with a, with a quote on that last point about sort of the impact of panelists. It's not just about these sort of recommendations that come out of it, but also on, on these individuals and all of their networks. Um, this is a statement by, uh, that was just voluntarily written by a panel a few years ago. Um, and uh, they said, many of us consider this process to be our most meaningful experience in politics. And for those of us who have struggled to keep faith in the political system, it helped to restore it. And I think we would all think that that's a, a reaction that we uh, all hope um, that uh, all citizens have about our democracy. Thank you. Gracias, Lynn. Thank you. Tengo miles de preguntas que me gustaría hacer, pero me voy a pegar a, al protocolo y tenemos tres en la app. Seguimos recibiendo todavía. A lo mejor tenemos tiempito para alguna más. Voy a arrancar con la primera. ¿Es la tecnología la única forma de innovación? Yeah, I very much agree, and uh, I think from our perspective, we've tried very hard to integrate, um, for example, online sort of deliberative aspects into our processes, and so far we're fairly pessimistic about it. We think they're, they're potentially very good for sourcing ideas, for sort of getting a lot of people involved in quantity, but in terms of quality of really hard deliberation, um, I think we think that the innovation is still face-to-face. -face. 